good evening dear friends so thank you madam for your kind words i am thankful to dr banzi sabu and his team for inviting me here in this prestigious issue uh, can you see my slides ma'am yes sir yeah okay. yes sir they are so, seen sir as uh, the topic given to me is management of postprandial hyperglycemia so let's start with i will be having some introductory uh, aspects of uh, postprandial hyperglycemia what will be its consequences what are the guidelines recommending about the management of postprandial hyperglycemia and then what are the different uh, therapies which are available to us dear friends uh, diabetes is not a simple hyperglycemia problem now we know it is so complex and it is a lifelong disease which require multifactorial risk reduction strategies and in that context earlier we were just looking at glucose profile of our patient but now we are looking at this glycemic pentad which comprises of not only fasting and postprandial and hv1c but also reducing hypoglycemia and glycemic variability and today we will be discussing here the importance of postprandial hyperglycemia we all know that after the meal there are insulin releases from the beta cells they have in a normal person a uh, first phase insulin secretion and second phase of insulin secretion first phase starts immediately after the meal uh, lasted for few minutes second phase is a phase which is uh, sustained till normal glycemia is restored and in our diabetic patient we all know that in type 2 diabetic patient there is a loss of first phase of insulin uh, secretion and because of this loss of first phase where large amount of insulin is released which is not available in type 2 diabetic patient leads to increase in postprandial hyperglycemia postprandial hyperglycemia you see patients with type 2 diabetes spend more than 12 hours per day in this postprandial state where we are having three major meals and sometime two or three minor meals and here you find that large number of uh, time our patients profile remains in a postprandial state Uh, attaining a A1C below seven percent is difficult, but it is very very important because so many landmark trials, like DCCT UK PDS, has clearly established that reducing HB1C will reduce the complications of diabetes, and it is important that sometimes this postprandial blood glucose is uh, more troublesome than fasting blood glucose. and it has been proven that it is independently linked to many of the diabetic complications in india we had large amount of carbohydrate intake in our diet in one of the landmark study by the name of starch uh, they looked into the composition of carbohydrate in our diet and they say that 64% of total energy from the diet is uh, arrived from uh, carbohydrate and it is equal in all the parts whether it is north south west and east or central india and we are consuming last our large amount of uh, consume large amount of carbohydrates and postprandial glucose of 62.5% of this diabetic population were above the target of 180 mg per deciliter and inadequate glycemic control in diabetic patients might be related to the higher dietary carbohydrate consumption among the indians in one of the another study by the name of tight study in this study they looked into indian population of type 2 diabetes having higher burden of poor glycemic control and here they say that more than 24% of patients were only having good control 76% of the patients were having poor glycemic control and among them 62% were having a hb1c between 7 to 8% and 33% were having a hb1c between 8 to 10% so our population is having uncontrolled hyperglycemia overall 42% of these patients are having uncontrolled fasting plasma blood glucose but if you look into uncontrolled postprandial blood glucose it is 62.9% indicating that it is more difficult to control postprandial hyperglycemia in our indian patients as compared to fasting and this study highlighted the need for early implementation of optimum glycemic uh, you can say therapy for our diabetic patient and in that uh, choosing a pharmacotherapy which is taking care of postprandial hyperglycemia 
Is postprandial hyperglycemia harmful to our patient? It is an independent risk factor for the cardiovascular complications and it is associated with increased risk of retinopathy, increase uh, in uh, carotid intima media thickness, decrease in myocardial blood volume and blood flow, impaired cognition functions in the elderly patients, and postprandial hyperglycemia causes oxidative stress, inflammation, and endothelial dysfunction. And uh, IDF clearly says that postprandial hyperglycemia is harmful and we should be addressing it. And this postprandial hyperglycemia is a type of glycemic variability where after the meal, there is a rapid rise in blood glucose, which is acting as a glycemic variability component. And here you find oxidative stress because of these glucose spikes, which is a inflammatory scenario, which leads to endothelial dysfunction. So postprandial hyperglycemia leads to overloading of our mitochondrial metabolism auto-oxidation, early or reversible glycation, and increased carbonic stress. Thereby, there is uh, more of oxidative stress leading on to so many uh, pathways, leading on to complications like protein nitration, PIPAR activation, increase in nuclear factor, kappa B activation, LDL oxidation. Cardiovascular diseases is linked to postprandial hyperglycemia. It is Postprandial hyperglycemia is an independent uh, a risk factor for the development of cardiovascular disease. It is a better predictor of cardiovascular disease than fasting hyperglycemia. There are so many studies which are looking into this relationship. And in one of the studies, they say that postprandial glucose appears to have a direct relationship with cardiovascular disease. Hyperglycemia, even across the non-diabetic range, was associated with cardiovascular disease. One study observed that increase in uh, postprandial glucose load is associated with higher cardiovascular mortality. Postprandial glucose excursion are associated with increase in systolic and diastolic blood pressure. And there are so many studies looking into the morbidity and mortality related to post challenge and postprandial hyperglycemia, like DECODE study, Chicago Heart study, diabetes intervention study. And you can see here that there is a clear-cut association of this postprandial hyperglycemia with more of cardiovascular risk. So what is the guidelines uh, telling about? So IDF says that postprandial blood glucose should remain below 160 milligram per deciliter. It, American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists say it should be below 140. It, American Diabetic Association says it should be below 180. It is slightly lenient and European uh, Association of Study of Diabetes, ESD, says that it should be less than 135. And our Indian Research Society for the uh, Study of Diabetes in India says that it should be below 160. So postprandial blood glucose should be measured about one to two hours after a meal. And self-monitoring of blood glucose should be considered as an important tool for looking into postprandial hyperglycemia. ADA recommends that endothelial function is negatively affected by postprandial hyperglycemia. It is clear that postprandial blood glucose, like preprandial hyperglycemia, contribute to elevated A1C level. Its relative contribution being greater than at A1C when the A1C levels are going closer to 7, target for glycemic control must be individualized and it should be between 140 to 180. And postprandial testing to be recommended for individuals who have blood, blood glucose values within target, but A1C is still high. And in that sense, measurement of postprandial blood glucose one to two hours after the start of the meal and using treatment aimed at reducing postprandial blood glucose below 180, according to ADA, is an important concept. Regarding enter nutritional therapy, diabetic specific formula appear to be superior to standard formula in controlling postprandial glucose, A1C, and insulin response. So, our diet is also to be modified so that uh, the glucose which is coming uh, from large amount from carbohydrates should be looked into. Breaking up prolonged sedentary life. Uh, time, life, time, sedentary time may also be encouraged so that we can break the long standing, uh, long sitting hours as it as, is associated with moderately lowering postprandial glucose level. 
and monitoring dietary carbohydrate are key in improving the postprandial uh, glucose control. So gl diet is also playing an important role. And if you look into IDF recommendation, postprandial hyperglycemia is harmful and should be addressed. Diet with low glycemic load are beneficial in improving glycemic control. Several classes of pharmacological agents, preferentially lower postprandial blood glucose, and they highlighted alpha glucosidase inhibitor, glenides, which are rapid acting insulin like secretagogues, short acting sulfonylureas, insulin, particularly rapid acting and ultra short acting insulin or insulin analogs are preferred here. And in addition, newer drugs like GLP-1 receptor agonist and DPP-4 inhibitors are uh, recommended. Postprandial blood glucose should be measured one to two hours after the meal and target according to IDF is, should be less than 160 milligram and SMBG is again highlighted. In addition to SMBG, now we also are looking at uh, the AGP uh, ambulatory glucose profile and where you can look into the 24 hour profile of our patients and you can see what is the fluctuations and glucose variability which is occurring because of postprandial rise. And now not only looking into fasting postprandial and HVMC, we are also looking at time in range, time above range, which is again divided into a range between 180 to 100, uh, 250. And what is happening if the patient is having more than 250. So these are some of the newer things where with the help of CGMS, we look into time in range, time above range and time below range. RSSDI uh, recommended the two hour postprandial blood glucose target of 160 milligram and medical nutrition therapy, including low glycemic load is recommended. AGIs, GLP-1 receptor analogs and DPP-4 inhibitors are recommended as a first line therapy and glenides and short acting sulfonylureas are recommended as second line agents for targeting postprandial hyperglycemia. Rapid acting insulin analogs should be preferred over the regular human insulin in, uh, in controlling postprandial hyperglycemia. And as a first drug, we know that um, alpha glucosidase inhibitor uh, like uh, Voglibos is an important drug here, which is inhibiting the absorption of carbohydrate from the intestine. And it is flattening out the postprandial rise in blood glucose. Uh, is, is the treatment of postprandial hyperglycemia beneficial? There are currently, you can say many uh, not many uh, R -R RCTs which are correlating the control of postprandial hyperglycemia and improving clinical outcome. But treatment with agents uh, which target postprandial blood glucose reduces the vascular events in primary uh, in our primary prevention and targeting both postprandial and fasting is an important strategy. And implement treatment strategies to lower postprandial blood glucose in people with postprandial hyperglycemia. There is a long list of drugs here and you find that in the lower panel, these are the drugs like glenides, alpha glucosidase inhibitors, uh, DPP-4 inhibitors, GLP-1 and amylin, which are mainly taking care of postprandial hyperglycemia as compared to fasting. All other drugs are having, you can say, more effect on fasting hyperglycemia as compared to postprandial. So management of postprandial hyperglycemia, you can see here, large number of these drugs are already highlighted uh, in the previous. And in that uh, second drug here is uh, uh, meglitinides. Uh, and one of the meglitinide is ripaglinide, which is a shorter acting insulin secretagogue, which is acting on the sulfonylurea receptor, which are slightly different from the sulfonylurea receptor on the ATP potassium ATP channel. And they closes the channel, open up the a calcium channel because of depolarization and then insulin is exocytosed. Ribaglinide is a, a short acting insulin secretagogue. It is to be given just before the meal. And you can see there are studies which looked into cardiovascular outcome. And they say that in patients who are having no previous MI or those who are suffering from previous cardiovascular disease, total death, cardiovascular death and MI strokes and cardiovascular diseases are less and cardiovascular death are less. Uh, with patients on dipaglinide as compared to patients who are on other sulfonylureas. Alpha glucosidase inhibitor we already covered and here they uh, highlighted that this is a drug which is really uh, Voglibos is flattening the uh, postprandial glucose curve. DPP-4 inhibitors we all know are good uh, drugs which are inhibiting the 
uh, you can say DPP4 enzyme, which is causing rapid destruction of GLP1 and GIP, which are released, which are important hormone released by our intestinal A and K and L cells. But because of this DPP4 inhibition, there is very little uh, these hormones which are reaching to the pancreas. But once we are giving DPP4 inhibitor, good amount of this uh, uh, incretin hormones are going to pancreas and they are causing increase in insulin and decrease in glucagon. And that's how they are effective. GLP-1 based therapies are where we are increasing the GLP-1 level to the pharmacological uh, high levels. And these are the drugs which are, uh, you can say, somehow resistant to DPP-4 enzyme. And these are GLP-1, which is again acting by acting on the alpha cells, inhibiting glucagon and acting on beta cells and increasing insulin. And we have now exenatide, liraglutide, dulaglutide available to us. Semaglutide is available in USA. And now we expect that semaglutide oral, that is ribalsis, will be available in next year to our patients. Rapid acting insulin analogs are preferred to look into a uh, reduction of postprandial hyperglycemia. We have three rapid acting analogs like insulin Lispro, Aspart and insulin Glulysine. There are some advantage of using these analogs. They are faster acting, higher peak insulin concentrations are reaching very quickly. They mimic physiological insulin profile. They improve postprandial glucose control. They also improve some uh, reduction in HB1C. They have lesser weight gain and lower risk of hypoglycemia. And they are to be given 5 to 10 minutes before the meal as compared to 30 minutes before the meal for human insulin, regular insulin. In some of our patients like infants and older adults which are very fussy about uh, taking meal, uh, that's why some of these analogs can be given even after the meal. So once the uh, these trials look into these trials, we say that Many a times our patient but, requires... Uh, sorry to bother you. Uh, two just, minutes. Just, finish, yeah, just finishing. Yeah. So they, uh, diabetes is a progressive disease and many a times we see that patients require combination of drugs. And in that context, if we are using multiple drugs and one of the drug is targeting postprandial hyperglycemia is always preferred. And we know that as the disease progresses, large number of our patients require combination of the drugs. And in that scenario, if you are having drugs which is taking care of postprandial hyperglycemia, uh, will be always preferred. So, dear friends, in the end, I will say that postprandial hyperglycemia is an important concept in Indian patients, particularly because of our, uh, you can say, our behavior, our uh, diet, and our. Uh, you can say function of our body in such a way that we have more difficult difficulties in managing postprandial hyperglycemia and in that sense some of these drugs like alpha glucosidase inhibitors or ripaglinide or dpp4 inhibitors glp1 and uh, insulin analogs rapid acting insulin analogs are preferred so thank you very much